I'm very pleased to announce that this video has been sponsored by Aura. I generally think of The Lord of the Rings as a pretty feel-good franchise. You've got love and tenderness, friendship and romance, heroism and victory, and it all wraps up with the nice, neat message that in the end, good will always triumph over evil. But what we may forget is that the title character, the Lord of the Rings himself, and all of his other villainous friends are essential to the function of the story. So today I'm going to guide you through the four biggest bad guys and gals of Middle-earth and tell you a little bit about how they got to be so bad and why that matters. Now all of these villains are terrifying, but they're nothing compared to the feeling of dread that I get when I get yet another call from a spam number. I don't even really want to answer my phone anymore because my last five calls were all from spam numbers. And the reason that all of us get so many of these calls is because data brokers are selling our private information to robocallers and scammers. Fortunately, this video's sponsor, Aura, can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers make it incredibly difficult for you to get this information taken down on your own, so let Aura take care of that hard work for you. Aura is incredibly easy to set up, and it acts as an all-in-one platform to get you everything from antivirus and parental controls to password management and identity theft insurance. If you want to try out Aura and keep yourself safe on the internet, you can go to aura.com slash part-time hobbit for a two-week free trial. That link is also in the description and you should absolutely check it out if you'd like Aura to do the hard work of keeping you safe online. I really appreciate you guys checking out Aura and supporting the channel and I am hugely appreciative to them for sponsoring this video. Now it all begins, well, at the beginning. The first things created by Middle-earth's primary god, Iluvatar, were called the Ainur. These were a host of disembodied spirits, usually split into two categories, the more powerful Valar and the less powerful but still mighty Maiar. And the first real act of Middle-earth was a song. Iluvatar gave his Ainur a theme to sing, and through this music, in the harmonies of their voices, they came to better understand the mind of Iluvatar himself and each other. Iluvatar's creative power, called the Imperishable Flame, infused this music that they sang together as they extrapolated from this original theme, writing a new and beautiful chorus together. A sound arose of endless, interchanging melodies woven in harmony, that passed beyond hearing, into the depths and into the heights, and the places of the dwelling of Iluvatar were filled to overflowing, and the music, and the echo of the music, went out into the void, and it was not void. As pleasant as this song was, there was still one Ainur who was not fully entranced, and his name was Melkor. Although all of the Ainur were powerful, it was Melkor who had been granted the greatest gifts of all. He was fair, strong, and out of all of the other Ainur, it was him that had the best understanding of the mind of his creator, Eru Iluvatar. He possessed all of the skills and talents of his fellow Ainur, and even further than that. But despite all of these gifts, Melkor desired more. He had gone often alone into the void places, seeking the imperishable flame, for desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own. And it seemed to him that Iluvatar took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. Melkor saw the creative beauty of Iluvatar's hand, and wanted to try it himself. He wanted to fill this void with his own forms and beings, and was very impatient for this work to start, even if it meant disagreeing with Iluvatar's plan for creation. This discomfort began to seep its way into Melkor's voice, tainting the otherwise quite unified song of the Ainur. The harmonies slid into discordance, and some of the Ainur even began to sing along with Melkor instead of Iluvatar. What had once been a single thread of dissonance was weaving itself out into a full tapestry, clashing heavily with the original song that Iluvatar had created. But Iluvatar, who was watching and listening to all of this, raised his hand 
And a new theme began, one more powerful and beautiful than it had been before. Charged by his emotion, Melkor's theme rose in volume, clamoring like the sound of war. But before Melkor's theme could drown out the other voices entirely, Iluvatar raised his hands again, and a new song emerged, this one playing in tandem with Melkor's melody. The one was deep and wide and beautiful, but slow and blended with an immeasurable sorrow from which its beauty chiefly came. The other had now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated, and it had little harmony, but rather a clamorous unison, as of many trumpets braying upon few notes. Iluvatar stood one last time and raised his hands, and above all of the other clashing and clamoring music, a single chord sounded and then fell silent. Iluvatar then revealed to the Ainur that the music that they had sang would be embodied into physical reality. Their melody and its beauty and discord became the blueprint for time and space and Middle Earth and Arda as we know it. This means that ironed into the very fabric of Tolkien's world is Melkor and his prideful descent. Iluvatar then spoke specifically to Melkor, saying, And thou, Melkor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me. For he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful which he himself hath not imagined." In that brief passage, Iluvatar sums up the entire gist of evil in this world. Though the powers of evil will blow and bellow and seek to corrupt all that is fair, nothing they could ever do or plan or make could truly disrupt the plans of the Almighty. Even discord forms a new harmony in the great song of the Ainur. Despite this, Melkor hangs on to his resentment, only growing more and more angry as time passes. Once Arda and the lands of Middle-earth had been physically created, many of the Ainur went down to inhabit it, and this included Melkor. He took one look at the world, just beginning to be shaped by the loving hands of the Valar and Maiar, and decided that he wanted it for himself or he wanted it to be destroyed. His brother, the Valar Manwe, was the first to push back against this. Manwe, though not quite as powerful or knowledgeable as Melkor, was very close to Iluvatar and knew a good deal about his mind, and so he was a very natural choice as the leader of the Valar. This began the First War, in which the Valar, guided by the plans of Iluvatar, tried to shape and create the new world of Arda, and Melkor, much like a petulant child, tried to disrupt their work at every possible turn. It took the intervention of the incredibly powerful wrestling Valar, Tulkas, to scare Melkor off and allow the Valar to finish shaping the earth. Fleeing the unified might of Tulkas and the other Valar, Melkor took whichever Maiar were likely to be loyal to him north to create a new kingdom, which he called Utumno which means the underworld or hell. Although Middle-earth was just beginning to flower and blossom, Atumno was a blight on its surface, spreading foulness and rot, and casting a dark shadow upon the first spring of Arda. But this sort of creeping corruption wasn't going to be enough for the prideful likes of Melkor. Bolstered by the strength of his obedient Maiar, Melkor launched a sudden attack against the other Valar. He destroyed the lamps that they were using to light the world, sending fires blazing across the land, marring the pristine beauty of that first spring forever. In the chaos of the aftermath, Melkor managed to escape, fleeing the strength of Manwe and Tulkas to cower in Utumno. With their first home destroyed, the Valar retreated west, creating the land called Valinor. This would leave Melkor with relatively free reign of all the lands of Middle-earth, and he did not waste time. While the Valar debated on the damage that an all-out war would cause on the land, Melkor traveled east, establishing another fortress called Angband. The Valar watched him from afar while they created a new light for the land, the two trees of Valinor, which would act as the sun and moon. They were aware of what Melkor was doing to Middle-earth, but they were also aware of the damage that an all-out war of the powers would cause to the land. This cautious sort of ceasefire was shattered by the entrance of elves into Middle-earth. Because at the time Melkor ruled Middle-earth, 
many of those first elves fell victim to him, being twisted into what we now know as orcs. The Valar, who had always had a very, very deep love for the elves, saw this and decided that defeating Morgoth was worth any damage that would be done to creation. And thus, the War of the Powers began. The Valar drove Melkor and his forces back to Atumno and laid a terrible siege to the fortress, rending the land apart in their desperation to reach their wayward brother. When they had finally wrenched him from the safety of his pits, they chained Melkor into submission and brought him back with them to Valinor. However, the Valar acted hastily and chose not to fully examine the pits and depths of Atumno and because of their haste, a great many foul and evil things were left to fester in Melkor's absence. Melkor, ashamed and furious, channeled much of his rage towards the elves, who he saw as the root cause of this defeat. After all, it was their entrance into the world that had forced the Valar's hand. Ever the holder of grudges, Melkor would never let this perceived slight go, and the elves would be a fixed target of his wrath for eternity. Once Melkor had served out his prison sentence, he was set before a council of the Valar to determine whether or not he should be freed. Though he acted as if he was remorseful, Melkor had been left alone for far too long, simmering in his own wounded pride. He looked upon the Valar, the children of Luvatar that sat at the feet of the mighty, and hatred filled him. He looked upon the wealth of bright gems, and he lusted for them. But he hid his thoughts, and postponed his vengeance. His brother Manwe was so fundamentally good that he couldn't comprehend Melkor's depravity, and he chose to set Melkor free, believing him to be a changed person. Manwe was wrong. Having had ages to mull over his schemes, Melkor worked delicately slowly corrupting the Noldor elves whom he resented. He whispered tales of power to them. He told them that the Valar were jealous of them. He warned them of the coming of men and proposed that soon the Valar might forget the elves entirely in favor of the next new shiny thing. It was a creeping, subtle deception, but the first one to fully give into it was the Noldorian elf, Feanor. Feanor hated Melkor, but his pride was stronger, and he would go on to commit atrocities against his own people, all in the name of justifying his discontent. Melkor's role in this cruelty would eventually be unearthed, but he had become quite adept at hiding and managed to evade capture. For his next trick, though, Melkor decided to have it go off with a bang. He teamed up with the primordially evil spider creature Ungoliant, and together they crashed one of the Valar's festivals aiming for the two trees of Valinor, the primary light source of Arda. Then the unlight of Ungoliant rose up even to the roots of the trees, and Melkor sprang upon the mound, and with his black spear he smote each tree to its core, wounded them deep, and their sap poured forth as if it were their blood and was spilled upon the ground. Ungoliant, who we will discuss more later, sucked the trees dry. In the shadowy cover, Melkor fled, using the chaos to steal the precious gems of Feanor, called the Silmarils. The Silmarils are three beautiful gems crafted by the mastery of Feanor's hands. They contain the last essence of the light of the two trees of Valinor, and they were so highly valued that well, Tolkien named a whole book after them. My copy's not here, because I, I was using it to research upstairs, and now it's too far for me to go get it. The Silmarils, as a manifestation of pure light, were something that Melkor both craved and despised. He set the Silmarils in his crown. His hands were burned black by the touch of those hallowed jewels, and black they remained ever after. Nor was he ever free from the pain of the burning and the anger of the pain. The crown he never took from his head, though its weight became a dreadful weariness. After this cruel strike, Melkor would be renamed Morgoth, which translates to the Dark Enemy. Now, there are a lot of things that happen after this, and maybe someday I will recount them all in detail. But to be honest, uh, I'm already a fair few pages into the script and have only managed to talk about Morgoth 
so we're gonna move a little bit faster through the events coming here. Morgoth continued being the worst kind of playground bully for the rest of the First Age, fighting Feanor and his kin, you know, destroying the lives of Hurin and his children, and at one point getting his butt kicked by Luthien. But despite years of dominion over Middle-earth, Morgoth was eventually defeated in a war known as the War of Wrath. In this fight, which lasted over 40 years, the Valar and Elves would join together to eradicate Morgoth's armies of orcs and balrogs and trolls, even defeating his secret force of dragons. Facing defeat, Morgoth once again hid in the most pitiful pits of his once great fortress until the Valar dragged him out chained him, stripped him of the Silmarils, and turned his great iron crown into a collar to be worn around his neck. Morgoth was forced out into the void to be imprisoned forever, the gates of his prison carefully guarded. Still, Tolkien does not let this be Morgoth's final note. The lies that Melkor, the mighty and accursed, sowed in the hearts of elves and men are a seed that does not die and cannot be destroyed and ever and anon it sprouts anew and will bear dark fruit even unto the latest of days." Morgoth is a fascinating character to me. He is the embodiment of evil, but it is such a very human sort of evil. The root of his sin is pride. He believed that he could create a melody that was more beautiful and more fair than that of his own creator, and this fundamental lack of understanding of his place in the universe is what damned him. Through Morgoth, we see what selfish pride gets you. To me, Morgoth isn't a very threatening or intimidating figure. He is, as I said before, a playground bully. Someone desperately trying to assert their power over the world, to prove that they're relevant, that they matter, when in fact, in the end, all of their efforts will make them nothing. They'll be left staring into that empty void, the void that they have once wanted so desperately to fill, that at the end of their days is still left empty. Morgoth personifies the capacity of humans for weakness and evil. He is prideful, pitiable, and tragic, and in the end, insignificant in the face of greater good. But there are less human and more primal powers of evil at work in Tolkien's world. And no character is more evocative of this than Ungoliant, the great fearsome spider whose origins are almost completely unknown. The Eldar knew not whence she came, but some things have said that in ages long ago, before she descended from the darkness that lies about Arda, when Melkor first looked down in envy upon the kingdom of Manwë, and that in the beginning she was one of those that he had corrupted to his service. But she had disowned her master, desiring to be mistress of her own lust, taking all things to herself to feed her emptiness. She hungered for light, and she hated it. Ungoliant spent much of her time nestled deeply into a ravine, devouring any light that chanced its way into her abode. From these rays, she spun webs of pure, choking darkness, thicker and thicker, until it blocked out any possible light. And at the bottom of this self-created prison, Ungoliant hungered. In the First Age, Melkor approached Ungoliant and offered her a feast beyond her wildest imaginings. Racked with hunger pains and tempted by Morgoth's promises, she traveled with him to the west. And there she would guzzle the light out of the fair trees of Valinor. Going then from tree to tree, she set her black beak to their wounds till they were drained. And still she thirsted, and going to the wells of Varda, she drank them dry, but Ungoliant belched forth black vapors as she drank and swelled to a shape so vast and hideous that Melkor was afraid. She and Melkor fled the scene, stealing the Silmarils along the way. Once they were safe, she demanded that Melkor fulfill his side of the bargain. In order to satiate her hunger, she wanted him to give her the Silmarils to eat. Melkor had never planned on keeping his word and refused, and in a sudden starving rage, Ungoliant struck out at him, 
wounding him terribly. The scream that Morgoth let out at this wound was so loud and terrible that the plane where this happened would ever after be called Lamoth or the Great Echo. It's rumored that any great noise made in this plane from that day forward would echo back a little bit of that shattering scream. Despite her bloated power, Ungoliant would eventually be driven back by an entire army of Balrogs, whereupon she fled and settled back into her hunger. We know that in her exile she bred with some of the local spider population, but other than that, Ungoliant's end remains somewhat ambiguous. Of the fate of Ungoliant, no tale tells. Yet, some have said that she ended long ago, when in her uttermost famine, she devoured herself at last. To me, Ungoliant represents primal evil in Tolkien's world. Ungoliant's ever insatiable hunger causes her to act like an animal, to trust where she shouldn't, to spin the black choking webs that would cause her own demise. Between Ungoliant and Melkor, Tolkien shows us the two facets of insurmountable evil. They're opposite sides of the same coin, one side wretchedly human, and the other innately inhuman. Even if she's dead though, Ungoliant's evil remains in Middle-earth, living on in her spawn, Shelob. And yes, last time I made a video where I talked about Shelob, I pronounced it Shelob. I have since realized my mistake. Uh, what are you gonna do? I'm human, and I don't have that many people to talk about these stories with out loud, so sometimes I mispronounce things. Sue me. Shelob first appears in the Two Towers in the caves at Kirith Ungol. How Shelob came there, flying from ruin, no tale tells, for out of the dark years few tales have come. But still, she was there, who was there before Sauron, and before the first stone of Barad-dûr, and she served none but herself, for all living things were her food and her vomit darkness. So, as you can tell, she was the spitting image of her grandma. Shelob acts as a guardian of sorts, though it would be pretty wrong to consider her fully in cahoots with Sauron's forces. They didn't really like her, but Sauron found her to be an excellent addition to his army, even if she did occasionally, you know, gobble up the passing orc. Frodo and Sam are led into her dark cavern by Gollum, who is attempting to have them killed, and they come face to face with the wretched form that the great beast has taken on. Great horns she had, and behind her short, stalk-like neck was her huge, swollen body, a vast, bloated bag swaying and sagging between her legs. Its great bulk was black, blotched with livid marks, but the belly underneath was pale and luminous and gave forth a stench. Her legs were bent, with great knobbled joints high above her back, and hairs that stuck out like steel spines, and at each leg's end, there was a claw. Frodo and Sam fend her off using the light of the Star of Erendil, captured in the file of Galadriel, and its pure light burns Shelob's eyes. But once the pain had faded, she only became more enraged. In the end, her attempts to poison Sam would earn her a terrible wound to the abdomen, the worst wound she had ever experienced. After this blow, she sulked back into her caverns, and much like her ancestor Ungoliant, Shelob seemed to disappear. Shelob was gone, and whether she lay long in her lair, nursing her malice and her misery, and in slow years of darkness, healed herself from within, rebuilding her clustered eyes, until with hunger like death, she spun once more her dreadful snares in the glens of the Mountain of Shadow, this tale does not tell. The evil of Shelob is similar to that of Ungoliant, but it's almost more animal. Ungoliant is somewhat incorporeal. She's immaterial, ancient, and huge, a figure of myth, an embodiment of evil. But her spawn, Shelob, is a much more realized, much more tangible version of this. We can see this in the text, where Tolkien offers us far more vividly gruesome descriptions of her physical appearance than Ungoliant ever got. The primal, intangible evil of Ungoliant 
has been combined with the very real, very physical fear of creepy, crawly creatures and things that go bump in the night. And for that, Shelob is all the more terrifying. But Shelob isn't the only character that received this treatment. If Shelob is the more tangible, less mythicized version of Ungoliant, then Sauron is likewise that for Morgoth. Sauron began much as Morgoth did, as a fundamentally good creature called Myron. He was one of the Maiar spirits who participated in the Song of the Ainur, and he was incredibly knowledgeable. Myron trained under the smithing Valar Aule and learned a great deal of crafting skill from him. You see, Myron was sort of obsessed with order and perfection and became very quickly disenfranchised with the other Ainur when they didn't see the inherent value of his careful plans and schemes. What began as a likely genuine desire to do good was twisted into a desire for power and control. And in Morgoth, the dissenting Valar, Myron saw the opportunity to impose his will on others. For some time, Myron acted as Morgoth's eyes and ears, spying on the other Valar for him, but after the lamps were destroyed, he crossed over into Middle-earth and pledged his allegiance to the Dark Lord. From then on, Myron would forsake his name and be known as Gorthar the Cruel or Sauron. He acted as Morgoth's foremost lieutenant at this point, leading the armies of Angband. When Atumno was sacked and Morgoth was dragged away in chains, Sauron was one of those foul things left behind by the Valar's haste. While Morgoth couldn't seem to escape the limelight, Sauron was able to ply his craft with much more subtlety. He had a cruel wisdom to him and managed to master the arts of sorcery and transformation, preferring to take the form of a great wolf. He took over the island of Tol Sirion and renamed it Tol Ingarhoth or the Island of Werewolves. From his throne in Tol Ingarhoth, Sauron wreaked havoc across Middle-earth, even becoming enmeshed in the great tale of Beren and Luthien. He captured the human warrior Beren and his elven companion Finrod Felagund, whereupon he killed Finrod and left Beren to die in his presence. But it wouldn't be long before Beren's elven lover Luthien came to save him. Sauron sent his hordes of werewolves out to strike upon them, but Luthien was protected by her great hound Huan, who had once been blessed by the Valar. Huan tore through the defenses of Tol in Garhoth, and with no choices left, Sauron was forced to throw himself into the fray. Then Sauron shifted shape, from wolf to serpent and from monster to his own accustomed form, but he could not elude the grip of Huan without forsaking his body utterly. Ere his foul spirit left its dark house, Luthien came to him and said that he should be stripped of his raiment of flesh and his ghost be sent quaking back to Morgoth. Sauron cowered before Luthien and Huan, and rather than abandoning his physical form and having to report his failure back to Morgoth, he granted them free access to Tol Ingarhoth and fled the scene after transforming into a vampire. Not like a twilight vampire though, like, like, vampires more like this. Deeply ashamed by his utter defeat, Sauron spent much of the rest of the First Age just licking his wounds, only emerging from the woodworks after Melkor had been taken away in chains. Once his master was no longer a threat, Sauron went and prostrated himself before Aonwe, one of the Maiar under Manwe's control. And it's actually pretty heavily speculated here whether or not Sauron's penance here was legitimate, because it's possible that he actually was sorry but unfortunately, either way, it all came to naught. Aonwe didn't feel like he had the authority to pardon or condemn Sauron, considering that they were both on equal footing as Maiar, and told him to instead go seek out his master, Manwe, in the West for forgiveness. Though this was a very wise and humble choice on Aonwe's part, it had pretty undesirable effects. Sauron was unwilling to return in humiliation, and to receive from the Valar a sentence, it might be, or a long servitude in proof of his good faith. For under Morgoth his power had been great. Therefore, when Eonwe departed, he hid himself in Middle-earth, and he fell back into evil, 
for the bonds that Morgoth has laid upon him were very strong. Sauron lurked about for some 500 years before traveling east to establish a new foothold. He created Barad-dûr, the tower at the center of his new kingdom called Mordor, and began gathering orcs and trolls and every other foul thing that traveled across Middle-earth to fill out his armies. He found men to be far too easy for him to tempt, and instead turned his sights towards the more powerful, wise, and fair elves. Sauron, ever the master of transformation, took on a beautiful form and pretended to be one of the wizards that would eventually come to Middle-earth, and he called himself Anatar, the Lord of Gifts. He managed to lie his way into the elven kingdom of Eregion, using their desire for skills and knowledge to ensnare them. There, he worked alongside the elven smiths to create the original Rings of Power that were supposedly there to help the elves maintain their control over Middle-earth. But in order to maintain the control that Sauron so desperately desired, in secret, he crafted the One Ring, the master ring that would allow him control over every other. Once that One Ring had been created, the elves realized that they had been betrayed and hid the three great elven rings from him. War ensued, in which the remaining rings of power were scattered amongst the various kings and dwarf lords of Middle-earth, and a great many lives were lost. Sauron was beat back by a joint force of elves and men, but the seeds of his plan had already been laid, and despite the fact that they knew they had been betrayed, the elves were unable to rout out the evil of the Rings of Power. One of these forces that had joined in to defeat Sauron was the island kingdom of Numenor. Numenor was a grand, advanced, and blessed civilization, but they were very prone to pride. Sauron recognized and identified this as their greatest weakness, and rather than continuing to try and go up against them with sheer force of numbers and armies, he chose a much more cunning route. He allowed himself to be taken captive, and from there he weaseled his way into the hearts of the leaders of Numenor. Yet, such was the cunning of his mind and mouth, and the strength of his hidden will, that ere three years had passed, he had become closest to the secret counsels of the king. For flattery, sweet as honey, was ever on his tongue, and knowledge he had of many things, yet unrevealed to men. Sauron wielded his powers like a knife, poisoning the weak hearts of Numenor from the inside out. He preyed upon their natural fear of death, assuring them that immortal life was possible if they only followed his words. At Sauron's guidance, they began to worship darker forces, erecting a temple to Morgoth in the center of the city where they would offer blood sacrifices to his name. But despite all of Sauron's carefully laid out plans, in the end, they would all come to ruin because of the intervention of Middle-earth's one god, Edu Iluvatar. Iluvatar saw the sins of Numenor and as punishment, he chose to remove them from the map entirely, calling upon the forces of nature to sweep the city and its vast armies completely under the water. Despite years of carefully crafted schemes, in a moment, Numenor had been blighted from the map and all of it lost. Sauron's physical form was completely annihilated by this act of God, but his spirit remained and returned to Middle-earth ever more resentful than before. Using the strength he had stored up in the ring, Sauron scraped together whatever power he had left, and he launched a sudden strike against the human kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor. He was met by a great combined force of elves and men called the Last Alliance. These forces were led by the elven king Gilgalad and the human king Elendil, and their combined forces brought Sauron to his knees, laying direct siege to the great tower of Barad-dûr. In the end, the leaders of both armies came face to face with Sauron himself, dueling him one on one. Sauron slaughtered both of these powerful kings, but in a final fit of desperation, Elendil's son Isildur took up his father's sword. Sauron himself was overthrown, and Isildur cut the ring from his hand with the hilt shard of his father's sword 
and took it for his own. At this point, we are caught up with the basic events of The Lord of the Rings, so I won't spell it out too much. Sildor was overwhelmed by the ring's power and lost it. And for 2,000 years, it drifted through Middle-earth, containing the last vestiges of Sauron's power. Whatever was left of Sauron in Barad-dûr took the form of a great lidless eye, forever gazing out across Middle-earth, watching to see if his plans came to fruition. In the end, it would be the exact antithesis to Sauron, a little hobbit with no schemes of grandeur that would be his downfall. Frodo, against all odds, brought the singular tool of Sauron's domination into the very heart of Mordor to Mount Doom where it had once been forged. The Dark Lord was suddenly aware of Frodo, and the magnitude of his own folly was revealed to him in a blinding flash, and all the devices of his enemies were at last laid bare. Then his wrath blazed in consuming flame, but his fear rose like a vast black smoke to choke him. For he knew his deadly peril, and the thread upon which his doom now hung. From all his policies and webs of fear and treachery, from all his stratagems and wars his mind shook free, and throughout his realm a tremor ran. His slaves quailed, and his armies halted, and his captain suddenly steerless bereft of will, wavered and despaired for they were forgotten. In a flash, Sauron realized that all of his schemes, the path to perfection that he had laid out since the very beginning of the world, had been for nothing. The creature Gollum, twisted by the siren song of Sauron's power, took the ring with him, falling, plummeting down into the chasms of Mount Doom. In the end, it was Sauron's own strength that ruined him. As the captains gazed south into the land of Mordor, it seemed to them that black against the pall of cloud, there rose up a huge shape of shadow, impenetrable, lightning crowned, filling all the sky. Enormous, it reared above the world and stretched out towards them a vast, threatening hand, terrible, but impotent. For even as it leaned over them, a great wind took it, and it was all blown away and passed. And in the end, that's all Sauron was. Terrible, but impotent. He is dissolved in a breath of wind like a cloud, and that breeze is likely a reflection or at least a reference to the breath of Manwe, the Lord of Air. Morgoth is menacing, certainly. He is a tremendous force of evil, banging at the gates of the world with all his might, seeking only to destroy, to break, to ruin. Sauron, however, did not seek to destroy, but to own. The only value that he saw in the world was his proposed domination of it. None of it mattered unless it was his, unless it was perfect in his eyes. Morgoth shows us someone who wants to see the world of Iluvatar burn, and Sauron shows us someone that wants to see the world of Iluvatar become his own. It's the same basic fatal flaw, but Sauron embodies it in a way that is likely hauntingly familiar. It's the zenith of human greed and lust, taking something that is not yours and twisting it until it is. And although Morgoth, as a more raw and primal form of evil, will always linger on in Middle-earth, his screams of agony echoing across the land, Sauron does not get to linger on. His agency, his plans, his schemes all lead to one thing. Utter annihilation. Tolkien's villains are the perfect example of what not to do. The end goals that they seek are fundamentally selfish. And because of that, they are an endless vacuum. No matter how much of themselves they pour into these self-centered efforts, they'll always end up right back where they started. Morgoth tried desperately to create things anew to fill the void and was left staring at the void for eternity, his efforts fruitless. Ungoliant, who sought to gorge herself in light, ended up producing so many shadows that she starved. Shelob craves to consume flesh and blood, but in the end, it's her own flesh that fails her. And Sauron's vain attempts to scrabble for control 
left him with nothing. Light enough to be blown away by a breeze. Of course, we do need good guys to stand up against the faces of evil, but in Tolkien's world, he shows us that the great pillars of evil and cruelty in the world will eventually crumble under their own weight. Writing and recording this video ended up being an absolute beast, so I'm gonna fully acknowledge that there are other creatures like Balrogs and Orcs and Urukai that are definitely pretty villainous, but they will have to wait for their own video. I also went down a whole research tangent of comparing Morgoth and Sauron to Renaissance depictions of the devil and going into modern depictions of the devil, but that uh, it was also way too long and will have to wait for its own video that'll be coming out in a few weeks. Either way, I am very curious to hear what you guys have to say about my conclusions here. I'm not like 100% on them, so I am very open to discussion of kind of how these villains connect into each other and how they tell the overall story of evil in Tolkien's world. So please, please discuss with me in the comments because I would love to hear your thoughts. If you want to talk to me about this topic on Discord or if you just want to support me financially, my Patreon is linked below. But honestly, even just liking this video and subscribing do so, so much to help what I'm doing here. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me today and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity day. Mm -hmm.